Hello and welcome to Game Sack. Back in the day, I really didn't pay much attention to the Game Boy Color. Kind of just thought of it as a system that played regular Game Boy games but added some frivolous color, you know, kind of like the Super Game Boy did. Boy, was I wrong. It turns out it's actually a system unto itself. Check it out. The Nintendo Game Boy Color. Introduced at the end of 1998, the Game Boy Color is the follow-up to Nintendo's incredibly successful Game Boy. It's backwards compatible with every Game Boy game and plays them with fake colors added on its non-backlit screen. Many Game Boy Color games were just regular Game Boy games with special color modes added when played on Game Boy Color hardware, and thus worked on both models. There were also many Game Boy Color games that were exclusive to the system and could not be physically inserted into an older Game Boy handheld. The Game Boy Color uses the same sharp CPU running at 4.19 MHz as the original Game Boy, as well as the same screen resolution and sound capabilities, but it has more RAM and 32,768 colors to choose from with a maximum of 56 of them on screen at any time. The Game Boy Color ended up selling just under 120 million units worldwide with 916 color games officially released. The hardware is cool and all, but let's check out the games. And for this episode, I'm going to focus mostly on original Game Boy Color software, meaning games that don't have a dual mode that's backwards compatible with the original Game Boy. Mostly. First up is, well, what else? Mario. Let's start with Super Mario Bros. Deluxe. It came to the Game Boy Color courtesy of, uh, let me see here, oh, Nintendo. This is basically just Super Mario Bros. 1 on the Game Boy Color, but really cropped in since the system has less screen resolution than an NES. It reminds me of playing a Master System game that's been converted to run on the Game Gear, which Sega did a lot. Anyway, now you can look up or down by holding the D-pad that way when you're standing still. It also adds an overworld map that's similar to the later games and lets you save. There's other little things in here, like being able to link up for multiplayer action, a challenge mode, and extra stages based on the Japanese version of Super Mario 2. Best of all, though, it's compatible with the Game Boy printer. Does the PlayStation 5 have a printer? Yeah, I didn't think so. Hey look, it's Conker's Pocket Tales, the first game with Conker ever. Well, I guess he did show up as a selectable character in Diddy Kong Racing first, but you know what I mean. This one's pretty funny because he's your typical cute mascot instead of the crude and rude character he'd be in his other games. You're trying to get your presents back so that your birthday isn't ruined. The game plays from an overhead perspective, similar to the Zelda titles from the time. You can press jump and even press it again to land on your enemies. You can also collect and toss acorns, but you'll need to find the slingshot first. You can also run by double tapping in a direction. The game is mostly simple fetch quests, but they still somehow manage to make it pretty fun. I like that you can save the game at any time pretty much anywhere. It makes fairly good use of the Game Boy Color's abilities with dark caves that you can still somehow see. The music can get a bit annoying though, especially since it starts over if you press pause, read something, or talk to someone. Still, it's worth checking out. I was pleasantly surprised. Here's Return of the Ninja from Natsume. That's right, this is in the Shadow of the Ninja series. Like that one and also Ninja Gaiden Shadow on the regular Game Boy, this is an action game. You can play as one of two different ninjas, though they both mostly play the same way through the same stages. The action here is pretty good. You can jump and attack. You also have some ninja magic with the select button. The game can be pretty tough in many areas as it's simple to get hit if you're not careful. Fortunately, you have a life bar, though it's not very big. You can collect rice balls to help you refill it and also things to let you use your ninja magic again. This game has a good kind of challenge, as you always want to try again, and it lets you try as many times as you want. You gotta make it through each stage using only one life, though. The graphics are excellent with lots of gradients in the sky and plenty of detail. It really takes advantage of the system having color. 
The sound and music are also excellent. It uses stereo effects almost 100% of the time you're playing, and not a lot of Game Boy Color games or even regular Game Boy games go beyond the boring old mono sound, so it's nice to hear that here. This is definitely a worthy follow-up. Let's check out Mario Tennis from Nintendo and Camelot. Want to play tennis as Mario? Well, you can go straight to hell because he's not here. Well, that is unless you unlock him in the story mode. That's right, there's a story mode, which is a pseudo RPG where you need to level up your skills playing tennis matches. You play as a boring human being and not a Mario universe character. You have an overhead area that you can roam around and interact with lots of other characters. Since this is a game from Camelot, the creators of the Shining series on Sega, the characters twitch a lot, and there are lots of awkward pauses between text boxes. It's just what Camelot does, they love twitchy characters. The tennis itself isn't bad, and it's pretty easy to control for the most part. It is a bit tough to aim the ball at first when your character is weak though. Still, it's pretty fun, and it's a light-hearted sports adventure. Of course, you can bypass all of this and just play tennis, but then you can't unlock all of the characters. There's also Mario Golf, also from Nintendo and Camelot. Same deal here, only it's golf instead of tennis. There are lots of characters to talk to and areas to roam around. The golf itself isn't bad, but at first it's hard to tell how hard you need to hit the ball. You'll learn soon enough, and you'll make some good shots once you do. You can hook this one up to the Nintendo 64 version using the transfer pack in order to transfer your pack. The colors in both games can be pretty vibrant, and the soundtrack definitely fits. Camelot is still making Mario tennis and golf games, and they'd quickly learn that people want to play as Mario and friends right away. It really is a good series of sports games. There are some games for the color that I had some high hopes for, basically just based on previous iterations in the same franchise, like this next one. Here's Chase HQ Secret Police from Metro 3D. Man, this is one secret I wish they would have kept to themselves. You start out by choosing three different police officers, each with their own vehicle. Then you have a map where the suspect is moving around, and you need to intercept them. If you do, you'll enter the driving mode. Here, it's kind of like the original Chase HQ games where you need to damage the enemy car until it breaks down. But you don't have to drive through an entire stage to catch up to them, they're there right away. You can even shoot them, but your ammo is limited. You also have three turbos that you can use. You battle until you run out of gas or the enemy is crippled. If you run out of gas, then it's up to the other two cars to get the criminal. This is not easy as they can be very fast. Not only that, but the music will destroy you. It's a neat idea, but sadly, it just didn't work out very well for this one. Motocross Maniacs 2 from Konami is awesome. The first game looked incredibly simple on the Game Boy. This one is a huge upgrade thanks to it being in color. It allows for a lot more detail and many different environments to crazily ride your motocross through. Your goal is to make it to the goal, but on the way you get to go through loops and all kinds of insane stuff. There's lots to slow you down as well. If you don't angle your bike just right, you'll fall off and lose time. That's no fun, so don't do that. You have some nitro and you can launch yourself with the press of a button and this is really helpful when going off of ramps. It also helps if you find yourself stuck in mud or something else that is limiting your speed. You don't have unlimited nitros though, so be sure to collect as many N icons as you can. You also don't have unlimited gas, so be sure to collect those as well. If you run out of gas, well... I already praise the graphics, which totally deserve it, but the music here is super cool too. It's also much better than the first game. It'll take you a while to master your technique, and as you can see, I haven't quite done that yet. 
but you'll have tons of fun as you do, and it encourages you to keep trying, and you won't mind. Elevator Action EX was only released in Europe and Japan. Compared to the original Game Boy game, which itself was based on the arcade, this one allows you to choose from three different characters. It also features redrawn graphics, in color of course. The game also moves a bit faster. So basically you're in buildings with way too many elevators, some of which only go up or down a couple of floors in the middle of the building. I'd sure love to see the construction plan for these places. Anyway, you need to work your way from the top to the bottom, or bottom to the top in some cases. Secret agents, I guess, are coming out of doors and you gotta shoot them down before they shoot you. You need to go into the doors with the exclamation mark to get the towels. Once you have all the towels, you can go to the exit. You can enter the question mark doors to get some different weapons. These can be really cool, but they can also be pretty bad, so generally I just avoid these. You don't stand right in front of the door to enter, but off to the side. You gotta stand where you see the little white things on the floor. The same goes for riding the escalators. Kinda weird, but you get used to it. The buildings eventually changed, but you might get bored before they do. Also, the scrolling is kind of choppy. All in all, it's not bad, but it's not for everybody. The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Ages and The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Seasons were released on the very same day. These were done by Capcom because Nintendo just wasn't interested in making Zelda games. Nobody wants those. Still, they did a great job of sticking to the formula. These are very similar games that share most assets, but your quest is different in each. Oracle of Ages has a lady kidnapped and taken back in time, and of course you need to go rescue her. Oracle of Seasons has a lady kidnapped, and now the seasons are all out of whack, and you must rescue the Oracle. Oracle of Ages is a bit more puzzle-oriented, while Seasons focuses a bit more on the standard Zelda action. These games aren't quite as polished as a real Zelda game made by Nintendo, but they're plenty good enough to get Nintendo's stamp of approval. And they're plenty good enough for you to play, too. The two games can communicate with each other via the link cable or a password. Once you beat one game, it unlocks nonsense in the other because of course these had to be on two separate cartridges because they want you to pay twice. Nintendo fans had already been trained to do that with the likes of Pokemon and whatnot, so I don't blame them. Both of these games feature a bit of extra functionality if you play them on a Game Boy Advance, like an extra shop that sells a Gasha Seed or another ring. Minor stuff. Still, these games are worth checking out because despite the double dipping, they're good. If I could only choose one, then I'd go with Oracle of Seasons, but of course if you prefer puzzle stuff, then Oracle of Ages will be more to your taste. Amazingly, there is even a port of Street Fighter Alpha on the Game Boy Color. Unsurprisingly, you have two attack buttons, a punch and a kick. Believe it or not though, the control works rather well here. I had no issue pulling off any of my special moves, they really did quite well all things considered. The gameplay feels great, much better than it has any right to. The graphics also aren't bad with good animation. Sure, many frames and motions aren't here and the characters are small, but come on, this is the Game Boy Color. Some of the stages even have a bit of animation in the backgrounds. The stages and music themes are each shared among a couple of different characters each. The music is also pretty good. Not amazing, but it certainly could be a lot worse. Each character has a unique ending, but it's basically just text in their profile picture. Probably the worst thing I can say about this one is that the characters all only have three colors each, and one of those colors is always black. The same development studio, Team Crawfish, would go on to port Street Fighter Alpha 3 to the Game Boy Advance. Definitely a good fighting game to play on the go. Sadly, there isn't a two-player link function.
Tower Quest from Sunsoft is another fighting game. Well, actually this is more of a fighting game RPG. You can choose from a few different fighters which are actually models that people build. Over the course of the game, you wander around the town and get into fights with other people's models. It's a one round match and if you beat them, you get some money. You use this money to buy parts which gives you more moves and makes you more powerful. No, it's not Street Fighter VI, it's Power Quest from Sunsoft. Eventually, you'll get to the tournament. Here, it's still one bout matches, but you go to the next match only getting a little bit of your life back. So you're gonna have to be really good to win this. The game uses a password feature for saving. Not optimal, but it'll do. The music is fantastic and full of stereo. This isn't overly long or anything, but it's a cool take on the genre, especially back then. Okay, now what's the very first game that you think of when you think of Game Boy Color? No, no, not that one, try again. No, not, not that one either. Uh, but, no, just, here you go. When you think of the Game Boy Color, you think of Duke Nukem. Duke Nukem 2D, that is, the way he was before his 3D adventure. This one plays similar to his first two games. You're wandering around very large levels collecting things and killing enemies. You can collect orbs, multipliers, and best of all, the letters to spell your own name. You can also get new and better weapons, but naturally they have limited ammo, so enjoy them while you can. You also need to collect key cards to get past certain electrical barriers of the same color. You can't match colored key cards on the regular Game Boy, now can you? Duke can also grab onto ledges, which he'll often need to do. It's very easy to get hit and take damage in this one as enemies sometimes take a while to die, and they're even a threat after they explode until they completely disappear. You can also take quite a bit of damage from falling, so be sure to grab onto a ladder if you can before you hit the ground. There's a lot of digitized sound effects in here, which is really cool for a Game Boy Color game. The control is pretty floaty and the music kind of drones on and on, but the game still keeps my interest up. Definitely check this one out. Dai Katana was released on the Game Boy Color, but only in Japan and Europe. Unlike the other versions, this one's actually quite playable. It's an overhead adventure game that focuses on action. You can play as different characters throughout your journey, each of them able to use different weapons. You can jump and there are even puzzles to solve. The game moves quickly, and I like that. I also like how you can switch between weapons once you find them, assuming your current character can use it. They can make attacking enemies from afar a breeze. Be careful though, because a lot of these enemies are anything but weak. The graphics are nicely drawn and colored. The music is fine, but it's another one that kind of drones on a bit. Still, be sure to check this out if you can. I have no idea why they didn't release this in North America. They definitely should have. Here's Bionic Commando Elite Forces from Capcom. But it was actually developed by Nintendo. Eh, Capcom develops a Zelda game, I guess Nintendo can develop a Capcom game. This is a great follow-up to the NES game, which itself was leagues better than the arcade original. Once again, you can't jump, so you rely on your grapple to get around everywhere. It honestly feels very natural here, especially after you've been playing the game for a few minutes. Your mind starts to work differently when it comes to figuring out how to navigate the levels, and it doesn't feel limiting at all. You start out with a few segments already on your life bar. Once again, you have a map that you need to advance through. Here, you can save your game and choose your weapons and items for the next area. If you get intercepted by a truck, you once again go into an overhead run and gun stage similar to the wimpy non-bionic commando game. 
These are fun, but they're also really short. Naturally, each side view area has a boss fight, and it's fun figuring out their patterns and giving them the beatdown with your bionic abilities. The visuals are all pretty good, though most of the stages do have a similar look. The music isn't bad, and there are even lots of voices. Weapon. Decoder. Nintendo did a good job with this one. This is Wendy every which way from way forward. You play as Wendy, the good little witch, which I'm not old enough to remember, and I'm old. For no reason at all, you open a treasure chest and green gems come out. Now you need to collect the green gems. Not a great setup for the game, but who cares? It's the gameplay that matters. And the gameplay here is pretty good. You ever play Metal Storm on the NES? Because that is just like this, and this is just like that. You can jump and switch gravity at any time and walk on the ceiling, and also switch back. You'll be switching back and forth and back and forth and back and forth to get through these levels. All you need to do is make it to the end and grab the gem. Along the way, you'll grab stars which fill up your life bar. You definitely want these. They also increase your firepower's range. If you take a hit, your shot's range becomes narrower. I suggest never getting hit at all, but hey, you do you. Sometimes enemies or stage hazards will be affected by switching gravity and they'll also switch. Each stage has three gems that you need to get. Then, you play a bonus stage which is similar to a horizontal shooter. Not quite as exciting though. If you play this on a Game Boy Advance, Advance World opens up right from the title screen. This is a new world that the Game Boy Color is just too pathetic and weak to be able to play. I mean, just look at all of this Game Boy Advance power! Hmm, I think the Game Boy Color could probably do this. I think they locked this away from you just because they could. Unfortunately, that means the game is only four worlds long, and a password is provided for each and every level. The graphics tend to be fairly good. Like Metal Storm, this features overlapping parallax scrolling on a system which technically shouldn't be able to do this. I definitely appreciate the effort that WayForward put in to have the game do this effect. On the audio side of things, the sound of music can be extremely painful to your ears. This one is enjoyable, it's just too bad a fifth of the game is held hostage unless you buy Nintendo's brand new portable. Oh wait, it's not brand new anymore. Silly me. Metal Gear Solid even came to the color. Despite sharing the same name, this isn't a port of the PlayStation game. In fact, this one is basically an alternate version. The original game is still taking place seven years prior to this one. It plays from an overhead perspective, very reminiscent of the first two games. Naturally, the gameplay is essentially the same as those. Get items, equip them, use them, etc, etc. As usual, you'll find a gas mask to help you survive rooms with poison gas in them. And what about those invisible infrared beams? Does Snake use his smokes? Goodness no, now he has foggers for that purpose. Foggers. I like how you can see the fog emanating from Snake's hand when he has it equipped. In this one, you can crawl on your stomach by pressing start. That's pretty exciting. You can also flatten yourself against a wall and scooch along or even knock it to distract an enemy if you'd like, just like the real Metal Gear Solid. Weirdly, this one is divided up into stages. They just end once you get to a certain point, and then the game tells you what a horrible human being you are for not being super awesome at the game. There are 13 of these stages, and they can get rather long. At one point, you're supposed to find an enemy wearing a red hat with long blonde hair. Can't do that on the wimpy regular Game Boy! That's right, color opens up a whole new world. The graphics fit the game like a glove, especially if you played either of the first two games. The music can be good at times, too. This is definitely a standout title for the portable.
This one's called Hunter x Hunter, Kimdan no Hiho, I guess. This is based on an existing IP, as you can probably tell by the drawings and all of the text. But the meat of the game is an action RPG, and it sure looks a lot like Castlevania, doesn't it? You have a whip to dispatch enemies, and you can even get items from cherries instead of candles. You have a management screen, which is all in Japanese, but here you can use items to get some life back and things like that. The gameplay would be pretty good if the A and B buttons were correct. You jump with B and attack with A, which is completely backwards, like an old Sega Master System game. But this is Konami. I'm amazed that they didn't know any better. I couldn't find a way to switch the controls. There's no translation to this one yet at the time I'm making this episode, not that I could find anyway. Just some animes on YouTube that had some translations, which doesn't really help. I definitely hope it gets translated sometime, as this could be pretty entertaining. And reverse the buttons while you're at it. Hey, remember me? Yeah, I'm still here talking about Game Boy Color games. You down for 10 more? Well, technically eight more? Awesome. It's Mega Man Extreme from Capcom. That's right, it's Mega Man X on the Game Boy Color, more or less. Some things have been reimagined or reworked. In the game, Mega Man X knows that he's been in these stages before because they're in the past. Now he must fight through versions of them again with some new surprises here and there. This one features autosaves a few times in each stage, which is basically just a checkpoint. It's definitely helpful to know where these are, though, when you run by them. The graphics look great, with some nice color gradients on the stage introduction screens. The stereo music is nice, too, and won't disappoint. If you enjoy Mega Man X, no doubt you'll get a kick out of this. It'll also work on a regular Game Boy. naturally followed up with Mega Man Extreme 2. This is more of the same here, which isn't a bad thing if you like Mega Man X. Despite the similarity in visuals with the previous title, this one can only be played on the Game Boy Color. You can play through this one as Mega Man X or Zero. Their play styles are very different from one another. I personally can't get much into Zero, but I do know that a lot of people enjoy playing as him. Once again, this is a very well-made game with great visuals and energetic music that's in stereo. This portable game has some great action awaiting you. In color! I loved cruising Exotica in the arcade and even on the Nintendo 64, so I've got to check it out here. It's going to be great. Well, the graphics are impressive for the Game Boy Color on a technical level. Unfortunately, not much else is impressive. The control is very slow and floaty, which doesn't exactly make for an exciting racing experience. Still, the game grows on you a tiny bit the more you play it. There are tons of tracks to race on, even Mars here. You can double tap the accelerator to gain a teeny bit more speed for an extremely short amount of time. The audio is generally pretty bad and you'll probably want to turn this one down a bit. This could be worse, of course it could be better too, but I had to check it out. Here's Bomberman Max Blue Champion from Hudson Soft. This is mostly a regular Bomberman game, but they have a story with it, which I of course skipped. Drop your bombs to destroy the enemies and other obstacles. But watch out for your own bomb blast, which gets longer and longer the more you power it up. Touching enemies is also instant death. In some stages, you need to rescue a thing called a Cherubomb, and you need to collect them all. 
That sounds familiar. As a Bomberman game, it's fine. It's good, actually, but, you know, it's a little unspectacular. There's also Bomberman Max Red Challenger. Yeah. This is basically the same exact game, but you play as a different character, and you also have different cherub bombs to collect. Again, you need to collect them all. That's how this works. That's how they get you. Naturally, this is a completely separate cartridge. Why would it not be? This is what Nintendo fans want. Different colors of essentially the same game. So yeah, not much different here for your money. There's also Bomberman Max Ein version, which was only released in Japan. In fact, it's very rare, as you could only get it in a contest run by Pentel, a Japanese company who makes stationary products. The Ein is a mechanical pencil, or maybe it's mechanical pencil lead. I really don't know. I'm not a Pentel groupie. Anyway, in case your eyeballs aren't working, this is basically the same game as Blue Challenger. Just incredibly rare. Or how about Bomberman Quest from Hudson Soft? That's right, it's a Bomberman action RPG, if you consider Bomberman part of the action genre. I don't know, is it? Anyway, your shuttle full of monsters that you've captured crash lands on an unknown planet. The monsters have all escaped, and now you need to recapture them and find your engines. The battles are fought Bomberman style, and both you and the enemy have a life bar. You also have a town where you can do a few things. In one building, you can increase the power of your bombs and other items with additional items that you've collected by defeating enemies. You can equip different items to the B and the A buttons in a manner of your choosing. This is a cute game, that's a good idea. I just wish Bomberman would move a little faster. Seriously, pick up the pace, little guy. If you're a fan of Bomberman and also like RPGs that aren't overly complex, then this one's a no-brainer. While this one also works on the regular Game Boy, it's still my favorite Bomberman game on the color. This is Mickey's Racing Adventure from Rare and Nintendo. This is basically kind of a light racing RPG of sorts. Pete's gang has taken all of your stuff, and you'll need to beat his cronies at races to get it all back. Okay. You guide a giant Mickey around town, and you need to find pennies and Disney dollars. The pennies let you ride the train to the place where you'll do your racing. The train ride itself is a sliding block puzzle where you need to make sure the train goes over all of the red dots which will explode the exit open, otherwise you can't get there. Fun! Once there, you need to make sure you have enough credits to get into the race and you'll get more credits if you win. The racing itself isn't entirely dissimilar from Rare's RC Pro-Am if you recall that. Wrenches on the track will give you a speed boost. You can upgrade your car's power or even buy new ones with Disney dollars and you'll need to do this as soon as you can. You can even buy magic effects which act as items during a race. Watch out for Pete's cronies wandering around. If you bump into one, you'll drop a Disney dollar. You can also let other characters take over and they have their own set of races to win. Not all characters are available right away. You need to get to a certain point in the game for them to show up. The graphics aren't bad at all. The music is good and even in stereo, but there are no sound effects at all during the races. This is a cool game, and while it isn't perfect, it is fun. Two years later, we got Mickey's Speedway USA, also from Rare and Nintendo. This one completely gets rid of the adventure overtones and focuses completely on the racing. You can choose from six characters in this one. Pluto has been kidnapped and the only way to get him back is to race, I guess? This makes no sense. Why are we battling each other on the racetrack if we all have the same goal? Anyway, the player sprites seem to be borrowed from Mickey's racing adventure. It controls pretty much the same way as well. There are items in here and you can use them by pressing up. The issue I have is that I'm racing alone almost the entire time. It's very difficult for me to catch up to even the third racer in a four-character race, at least playing as Donald. 
Maybe I'm pressing the wrong button? I don't know, but there are only two buttons on the system. The music is good, but it's in mono this time. I like the racing adventure game more than this one. can't have an episode about the Game Boy Color and not mention Shantae from Way Forward. Did you think I was going to forget? It's okay, I forgot a ton of other games. This adventure platformer was released at the end of the system's life, right around when the Game Boy Advance came out. You play as a half-genie named Shantae who attacks with her purple hair. She's after a steam engine that was stolen by the pirate Risky Boots. If you've played any game in the series, then you know what to expect. You explore Scuttletown in a third-person view and enter shops and the like. You can buy stuff to help you out, heal yourself, save the game, earn money in the rhythm dancing game, and get info from the people in the town. The action is pretty good, but the controls feel a little slow. This is probably because this isn't the first game I've played in the series and I'm too used to the newer games. The stage design, of course, isn't quite as good as the later entries either. Now, don't get me wrong, this is a fantastic game here. You've got some backtracking to do, and that makes this game a Metroidvania. Sorry, but those are the rules and there's nothing you can do about it. Metroidvania. Since this game was released when the Game Boy Advance came out, they included some things that you can only get if you play it on a Game Boy Advance. First and foremost, the game is substantially brighter. This was done because it was felt that the game looked too dark on the Game Boy Advance's screen, whereas it wasn't really an issue on the Game Boy Color's screen. There's also a dance to transform into a Tinker Bat that you can only do while playing on the Game Boy Advance. But supposedly you're not missing much by not having this dance. Regardless of how you play it, the visuals are among the best on the system. There's really cool looking transitions from day to night and back every couple of minutes. The music is extremely fitting and in full stereo. Jake Kaufman rarely disappoints. I mean, he sometimes does. Nah, I'm just kidding, Jake. Anyway, the music really helps you get into the game. It's too bad they made so few copies of this game when it was released all those years ago, but there are many other ways to play this one these days. And I highly suggest that you do. And there you go, that's the Game Boy Color for you. I also wanted to show Kirby's Tilt and Tumble, but since that has accelerometers in the cartridge, I can't play it on an EverDrive. But if you have access to a real cartridge, give it a whirl. And yeah, I know I didn't show any Pokemon games, but I'm not really into Pokemon, so you probably don't really want to hear me talk about it, otherwise everyone's just gonna be grumpy. Anyway, what's your favorite Game Boy Color game? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. My life is so bland and boring. What you need is some color. Color? What is color? The Game Boy Color. Whoa, now this is intense. Now you can play video games in color for the first time ever. And now I am in color too, like that movie, Pleasantville. That movie sucks compared to the mighty Game Boy Color! Leave it to Nintendo to innovate video games once again! Don't be a worthless human being, get the Game Boy Color today! It's really the only way your life has value!